It's all good, good. O OJ Chit Chat. OJ Chit Chats. It's all good. It's juicy. Welcome to a special edition of OJ Chit Chats. Uh, now, I call this the special edition because, uh, you know, in the past four podcasts that we did, we've always had guests. And today, we are each other's guests. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that we don't have any guests, but uh, we realize that we've got some, some common interests. And, and I thought it was interesting to talk about it also because... You know, uh, if you don't know, Un is a very accomplished, is that judoka? Is that the word? Judoka, right? The, the phrase would be judoka, yeah. And I don't know how many people know this about you, you know, because you, you apparently don't talk that much about it, but you're, you're uh, into silat in a big way. Uh, and, not big way, la, you know, I, I dabble <laughs> in it, but I, I'm more into fitness. I dabble in a little bit into all kinds of martial arts, la, but it's, yeah, I mean, these days with bad knees, you know, so... Yeah, so today's topic is, well, you guessed it, martial arts. We're going to talk about martial arts and a little bit about fitness and, mm -hmm. and exercise. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's start with uh, that Sila thing. Uh, it it did, did surprise me when we spoke offline and you said that you don't really like to talk about it. And um, first of all, why not? And, uh, you know, and what, what are you prepared to talk about? Mm, well, I think it's just a very uh, uh, side of me that's, that's I've grown with it. You know, I've been doing it for many years. But you know, if you know the the, the origins of Silat, it's actually a dance, like Capoeira also. So it's actually a dance. So uh, they call it Tari Silat, you know. So it's actually a dance which then mm. uh culminates into 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 defense or attack or stuff like that. So uh the reason I got into it was actually a bit of discipline like right? and and it was not more the Sila, it was just my instructor who was, or my top guru who was at that. He was a very smart man who captivated my, my attention. So, and, you know, I thought I was borderline ADHD like, until I met him. So, yeah, so, so he actually, you know, he was, he was very uh, integral in my development. So, um, why I don't speak about it? No particular reason. It's just that I think there's, you know, it's, it's not very, it's, it's not something you talk about or, you know, it's just something that you practice. I mean, is it part of, the Silat tradition that you don't talk about it? Uh, I think it's just me. Like, you know? I think it's just okay. me that I, I don't usually speak about it so much. But yeah, I really enjoy it. I like the, I, I like the traditional Malay, Indonesian, uh, you know, um, arts and all that. So I also studied a bit of uh, Taekwondo and Karate and stuff like that. I like this because it is engulfed in tradition, you know. It's, there's a lot of tradition. There's, a, you know, um, from from the Chris to the... the Tanja, if you wear and the wear, it, it's to me. It's, I love, I love the tradition. So, and I grew up in a in a in in Central in a in a railway area, and my neighbors were all Malay. So that's why I speak Malay really well. And I, you know, so to me, it was just natural. And how did you first come across Silat? Uh, I think one of my friends who told me, "Hey, here's this guy who's teaching, and let's go and have a look." And I was like, "And this is my clubbing days, like, you know? So, so I went and checked him out, and I said, "Whoa, this is very interesting." And, uh, and and the thing was, he didn't charge for it. So that was to me the number one catch line. He didn't charge. He didn't charge no, anything no, at no. all? No, it was pro bono. Really? Yeah, so. Wow. Yeah, so, and, and, you know, I went there more for, for after the martial arts where he'll sit and chat and impart his knowledge on life and stuff like that. So to me, it's like, hey, you know, let's do away the martial arts. Once it's done, we sat down, had a cup of tea, and then he will, he'll talk about life. And that to me, or, or they called it in... in, in Arabic Muzakara, that means we, we, we talk about stuff. So I actually picked up a lot from that. So it was one of those early days, I would say, TED Talks, you know, so, uh, yeah. So, so you learn a lot of uh, philosophy and a lot yeah, of but, uh, life. Yeah, but I'm sure as a Zuluka, you also will admit that martial arts is actually life because, you know, you know when to, you know, it, for me, is you know when to attack, you know when to defense, you know when to be calm, you know, you know. And, you know, that is when you start to use your emotion and stuff like you lose already, so... I guess it teaches you a lot. I wish I wish it was that easy, you know, to put into practice, but it's not. It takes years and years and years and years of actually mastering your 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 craft. I mean, I, the reason why I find it interesting, or maybe I should say intriguing, that you don't talk so much about it, because I talk about judo all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, well, I, well, in contrast, you know, I talk. I mean, everybody. I, I mean, everybody who knows me knows I'm I'm involved in judo because I'm I'm constantly talking about it. Maybe to their annoyance. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I think I'm weaning off it a little bit. I, I actually speak a lot about fitness and gym and going to you know. So 
I'm not really active as before. I still go, but you know, it's not, you know, I guess age has caught up with me a little bit and, and you know, so I like, to, you know, these days you can, you know, you don't have to run like a, a Usain Bolt, but you can teach somebody to run like Usain Bolt, you know what I mean? So I guess that's the principle that I, I don't share so much about it because you know why? To me, it's, it can be very mundane, you know what I mean? So not everybody will be interested in it, but fitness is, is something that everybody's, you know, is everybody is involved in right here. Right. So you don't want to bore people about Sila. Mm -hmm. Like I bore people about judo. <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't say that. But but you should. But you should talk about your judo because I I read you are a Malaysian judo guy and you represented the country and, yeah. and so yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, I was a, a serious competitor at one time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a long long time ago. How how long? Still, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the early to mid nineties. Okay. So that's really quite a long time ago. Uh -huh. And uh, I, yeah, I represented Malaysia in, uh, in two world championships wow. and How did you Asian do? championships. Well, the first world championships, I did better than the second one. The first one, I, uh, I was still a student. And uh, I guess as a student, in a way you have more time because all you have to do is study. You don't have other responsibilities besides studying. And uh, during summer vacations and stuff like that, I could do judo, you know. So I was in a better shape, I guess. And I, I it was the 1993 World Championships. And uh, where was this actually? In Hamilton, Canada. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, that one I got, if I'm not mistaken, I was 13th, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. certainly in the top 20. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But I didn't crack the top 10, which was what I was hoping to uh, mm -hmm. to achieve. But, you know, but it was still, still a, a an accomplishment because I think prior to that and since that, I don't think any Malaysian has ever gotten that kind of uh, position in, in world judo. I mean, most uh, Malays other Malaysians have gone to uh, world judo championships, have gone on to represent Malaysia, but usually they, they go out in the first round. So why is that? Why, why is that? Is it, it can't be weight because there's a weight class. So why is that? Yeah. I, I think it's just that judo is not very popular in Malaysia. And so we don't have a lot of uh, a lot of judoka unlike uh, say badminton you know everybody plays badminton and and as a result you know you've got tons of badminton players to choose from uh, and, and similarly like like soccer or football mm -hmm. uh, in brazil mm -hmm. everybody plays football right and so from there you can choose you know from from the the, the millions of people who play it so in malaysia uh, there are very few judokas it's not a popular sport here so there's not a lot of uh, uh, choice, you know. It's judo in the sea games. Eh? It is, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's it's actually a major sport. It's an Olympic sport, mm -hmm. and it's there's world chap there's a world championships every year. It's in the Asian Games. It's in the sea games as well. So yeah. Did you participate in the sea games? No, you see, that's the interesting thing because my active years were when I was in uh when when I was a student uh, at the university, uh, in in the US. Mm -hmm. And and so I was overseas most of the time and couldn't actually represent Malaysia in, in the Sea Games. Uh, actually, the, the reason I could represent Malaysia in the World Championships was that it was nearby. I was studying in the US and that World Championships was in, in Canada. So it, it wasn't it's that far. Not a far commute. La. <laughs> yeah, not that far. Right? It was just going up northward. And then uh, what happened was that I did well, as I mentioned, I did well in the 93 World Championships, uh, well enough that in, in 1994, the Malaysian Judo Federation actually said, hey, look, you know, you've never actually competed in Malaysia. You come back to Malaysia for the national championships in 1994. Did they pay for it or not? Yes, they okay, did. That's very they important. Did. So, yeah. so, yeah, whereas, you know, the world championships, I had to pay my own way mm -hmm. because I was unknown at the time. But by 1994, I was well known. Uh, in Malaysian judo circles uh, because of my performance in, in 93. And they, they flew me back to Malaysia. And um, actually, here's the interesting thing. Back then, uh, in 93, I was actually a, a small-sized 60-kilo player, believe it or not. Wow. Uh, yeah, I was just very skinny back then, in 60 kilos. And so when I came back to Malaysia, I was you know, uh, registered to compete at 60 kilos, which was to be expected. But then to my great surprise, they had also registered me to compete in the Open, which means I had to fight everybody else, including... But what was your weight? So you, you were below 60. I was about 59.5. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, so I was a natural 60 kilo player. And usually the Open weight competition, you have people 86 mm. and above, mm -hmm. or certainly not a 60 kilo player. 
But you know, I was I was not gonna say no because they had flown me all the way back to Malaysia, right? And uh, so I fought and won the 60 kilos. Then you know, I had to fight concurrent with that. I had to fight in the open. So I was going in between matches, right? 60 kilos here. Then a few matches later, I was fighting the open weight. Mm -hmm. and then go back to 60, and then fight the open weight. And I actually, uh, surprisingly, made it all the way to the final. Wow. And uh, yeah, and you know, along the way, I beat one player who was like over 100 kilos and all that. And so I made it to the final. And then I fought somebody who's actually relatively small for, for open. was uh, mm -hmm. still bigger than me, mm -hmm. but relatively small from Sabah. And we drew, we, we had uh, equal points at the end of the match. And back then, the rules were that when the score was, was a draw, the referees would make a decision who was the champion. So he didn't like you, the referee? <laughs> no, la, to be fair, I think the guy probably deserved it. So I got a silver, silver medal there. But you know, he didn't get more points than me. We, were, we, we had equal points. And uh, if not, I would have made history right, as the lightest ever Open way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Following my success in Malaysia, uh, at, at you know winning the sixty kilos and getting silver in the in the open way, uh, they chose me to represent Malaysia in the Asian Games in Hiroshima. But what happened was that because I fought in the open, which was uh, full of heavyweights, right? After the competition, I was limping, and uh, and it was so bad I ended up in hospital. <laughs> so I had to go to hospital and. And I had knee problems, and uh, I actually had to with I had to pull out of the the Asian Games. So I was the only judoka in Malaysia selected for the Asian Games that year, nineteen ninety four. But I couldn't go because mm -hmm. I was it was it a was it a bad injury or? Well, it's quite bad. And in in later years, I had to have surgery. So that's the danger of fighting heavyweights. You know, you might still mm -hmm. win and do well, but you you end up getting injured along the way. But after that, I went back to the U.S. to continue my studies. So, you know, I, I never really got a chance to compete in the region. I, I, my competitions were all, you know, more overseas in uh, the U.S. and uh, in Europe. So what, what, what is your fascination with judo? How did you actually find it? Well, you mentioned that in your case, it was because a friend introduced you to it, yeah? In my case, it was just uh, by chance, really, because, uh, you know, as a Malaysian, uh, as a good Malaysian, I was playing badminton, you know, <laughs> in, in, mm. as a loyal Malaysian, I was playing badminton at the university and, and I, I joined the badminton club and was very active there. It was full of, as you mm -hmm. can imagine, mm -hmm. foreigners, you know, I mean, because badminton mm -hmm. is not popular in the US mm. and there were Indian guys from India and, and Malays, lots of Malaysians and, and I was playing badminton, you know, three, four times a week. And it so happened that next door to the badminton club. Oh, so you picked up judo in the States? Oh, okay. Yes, I did. And while in the university. So what happened was that, uh, you know, when we had water breaks, we would all go out to the water cooler to drink and we would bump into the judo players and I got to know them. You know, I would ask them, what's judo all about? And then they, um, you know, they would invite me some, sometimes, say, hey, why don't you give it a try? So one time I did give it a try. I liked it so much. Uh, that I eventually ended up giving up badminton and I was just focusing on judo all the time. It really became mm -hmm. obsessed with it. And that's, that's how, you know, even though I started judo very late as a university student, I, and, you know, I, 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 I rose very fast and did mm -hmm. well enough to, you know, to win the Malaysian championship. What was your, actually, uh, you know, fascination with judo and how did you get into it? And yeah, I mean, I think the, the reason why I was so fascinated by judo and why I kept doing it and, and really even became obsessed with it was uh, a result of the way I was uh, uh, first initiated into judo. What happened was that I was in a, a club that was not so traditional in a very traditional judo club. Like for example, in, in Japan, you spend all of your time just doing break falls. What's you know, a break you fall? You probably do break falls for the first uh, oh, a break fall is when you learn how to fall safely, you know, so to speak. Yeah, you just, you, you know, you just fall backwards and you slap the mat and, and you'll do that for three months to six months, you know, uh, just break falling and not doing any real judo per se. And it's really boring and a lot of people will mm -hmm. drop out because it's like, hey, all I'm doing is break falling, right? But the club that I was with, it was more of a recreational club and it wasn't very traditional at all. And they, you know, the first day you go there, you do judo. You know, you actually, you know, it's just like wrestling or everything else. And, and I was fairly athletic, right? Like so, because I, 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 I played rugby and stuff like that. So I could take it. And on my very first day, yeah, they did teach some break fall. But they, when, when they uh, proceeded to do randori, which is the Japanese word mm -hmm. for sparring, basically. 
they they actually asked me to spar, and uh, even though I had no experience in judo, uh, but I sparred with two guys, two black belts. So the first guy was a French guy named Dominique. I still remember, and he threw me around like a rag doll, right? He threw me around everywhere, at will, you know, at will. Whenever he felt like throwing me, he could just throw me, and I was frustrated but also fascinated by that fact. It's like, how could this guy? throw me at will you know is he superman why why you know he looks the same size as me why how come he can throw me at will so that fascinated me and then i played with another guy named brendan who was a slightly bigger but not much bigger and he foot swept me he was a foot sweep expert you know so he he was i i walk a few steps and he'll sweep me and i'll he'll level me and i'll fall on the ground and get up he sweeps me again must be must be tiring man <laughs> <laughs> it, it was Tiring, frustrating, but at the same time, thoroughly fascinating. Because before that, you know, I was just a badminton player, and I, I just didn't know anything about um, martial arts or judo or anything. And suddenly, I was thrown in this environment where, you know, I thought I was a fairly active, uh, fit, athletic person, and these guys were throwing me around like a rag doll, like literally at will. And I, I told myself, this can't be. You know, I, I need to, I really need to learn this. This this judo so that they can't do this to me anymore. <laughs> so how long does it take to get a black belt? You know, an average person. Uh, well, average I would say would be about five years. Wow. Mm, yeah, mm. and uh, but it's also a function of how often you train and also you know mm -hmm. how how much activity you do, how much uh, competition and how much exposure you do, because you know somebody could be uh, training judo for five years but they only come once a month. Then they, their five years doesn't amount mm, to much. Mm, mm. Another person could be training only for three years, but mm. they're training every day. You know, so so for me, I was training every day. So mm, mm. so I got mine in three years. Yeah, so what's your belt now? You're like a... uh, well, I'm what they they would call third dan or third degree black belt. Like, you know, very really fascinating that you don't strike or you don't attack. Uh. So, so so what is the fundamentals of judo? Okay, yeah. So, uh, like in Silat, you guys do strike, you know. Yeah, you depending. Do... Yeah, depending on which Silat, lah. But there is strike and there is defense, like a lot of. I mean, I mean, the Silat that you practice is there striking. There yes, is, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So in judo, there's no striking. So that, in a way, differentiates it from uh, taekwondo and karate mm -hmm. and kung fu. Mm -hmm. It's more similar to wrestling than any of those other martial arts, actually. Mm -hmm. so, so take downs and all that no? yes yes so a lot of people think of judo as a martial art and would lump it together say for example with taekwondo and karate but it's it's really worlds apart from there and it's closer to wrestling and mm -hmm. uh, actually very close to greco-roman wrestling if you're mm -hmm. familiar with yeah. that and uh and i i the judo was uh, founded by a, a physical education professor from japan named uh, Dr. Jigoro Kano, and he. When when was this? Huh? This was in 1882. Oh, so not fairly recent, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not a mystical thing, and uh -huh. you know, this 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 Jigoro Kano is an interesting fellow because he uh, he he was a physical education professor, educated in English, you know, mm -hmm. and he worked for the education ministry. He was a headmaster at uh, some of the schools. He used to have a private uh, tutoring business where he taught. Uh, rich businessmen's children English, mm -hmm. and and he was the first representative of the International Olympic Committee from Japan and I think from Asia. So he was a very sophisticated man, uh, educationalist, and he wanted to create a system that was safe to practice in schools. I guess the traditional jujitsu which he had learned prior to him inventing judo. I, I mean, the, the art that was practiced there uh, was jujitsu, traditional jujitsu. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, so, you know, which is come back later to the, in the similarities. Yeah, okay. But jujitsu back then, the traditional jujitsu did involve striking and kicking as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, there were also elements of jujitsu that had throws and takedowns and grappling and mm -hmm. you know, groundwork. And he removed the striking part, the kicking mm -hmm. and the punching, just kept the grappling part. The rationale was that he wanted something that was safe to be practiced in schools because I think if you did a lot of punching and kicking, and you know if students come home with a black eye, mm -hmm, you know or mm -hmm. bloody nose, then mm -hmm. the parents will say, "Hey, I don't want my kid to do this anymore." And so, so judo was uh, in that sense safer because there's no striking to the to mm -hmm. the face or to the body, and you could go all out and wrestle your partner, throw him on a mat, and and still you know he would. Emerge from that relatively. You can get injured in judo, right? Of course, of course you can. Of course mm -hmm. you can. But 
no uh no strikes to the face you know mm-hmm. <laughs> no strike to the face or to the body so in that sense probably less injurious so i have to ask you this question so after you move from badminton to judo which sport made you get more girls uh neither i think neither. <laughs> <laughs> neither are sexy sports you know judo is such a unsexy sport i tell you what's a sexy sport is a uh, bjj lots of people yeah, like like bjj yeah. it, it's it's the is the hot thing right I, actually our our sort of like uh, podcasting idol joe rogan mm-hmm. he's into as you know he's into yeah. ufc but he's also a bjj practitioner yes, he's really yes. he's really into that and and a lot of people like it you know i mean you were talking about girls lots of girls do bjj they don't really do Judo. Yeah, after Linda Rousey, that just R- Ronda, Ronda Rousey. R- Ronda, Ronda Rousey, Rousey, yeah, Ronda Rousey. But, yeah, but she was from, she's from judo, you know. She's yeah. from from her judo. mother was a her mother, I don't know, sorry, world champion. Mother, yeah, mother was a world champion. Yeah, yeah, the first American female world champion, first American world champion actually. Mm. BJJ benefited from its association with UFC mm-hmm. because a lot of these UFC fighters, right, Ultimate Fighting, and I, I guess what is known as MMA. Mm-hmm. uh fighters they they have that bjj background yeah your submissions yeah. and all all that comes from yeah but you you know you were asking earlier uh, what's the difference between bjj and judo right mm-hmm. and it's actually very similar i'm not sure how many people are aware of this I, i'm not even sure whether many bjj people are, are aware of this but joe rogan has spoken about it before actually bjj came from from judo judo came from jiu jitsu right But Brazilian run that, run that by me again. Sorry. Okay, so so when people say jujitsu, there are different types of jujitsu. There's very traditional classical jujitsu, and then there's BJJ, which is Brazilian jujitsu, and judo came from classical jujitsu. Uh, Jigoro Kano, the founder of judo, mm-hmm. practiced practiced uh, jujitsu, and and then from there he synthesized judo, right? And then what happened was that in the early 20th century. Japan sent judokas uh, to Europe and even to Brazil to teach judo, to spread judo. And one of the masters of judo who went to Brazil, a guy named Maeda, went to Brazil and he taught judo there. Back then, in those early days, uh, judo wasn't always referred to as judo. Some some still called it Kano Jiu-Jitsu mm-hmm. because it was founded by Jigoro Kano, who was a practitioner of Jiu-Jitsu. So a lot of people still referred to it back then as Kano Jiu-Jitsu. And so it took off in Brazil as jiu-jitsu and it was because it, it had evolved in Brazil to focus almost exclusively on groundwork not so much on standing not so much on the throws but on the groundwork and which differentiated from judo quite a bit and it became known as Brazilian jiu-jitsu but it totally came from judo What are the, what are the famous ju- uh, Brazilian the family what's his name uh, Gracies Gracies yeah the yeah. Gracies, Ian, yeah. Ian Gracies and the, yeah they moved to the US mm-hmm. and they started the whole BJJ franchise you know and and it's huge it's yeah huge and they've got so many uh, siblings you know mm-hmm. there's so many so many Gracie brothers mm-hmm. And nephews and you as know. long as you're Gracie, you're selling line. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I actually met one of them and I I actually played some judo with one of them in when I was training in Los Angeles. They were uh, based in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and they uh you know they, some of them one of them I can't remember which one uh, came to my judo club and we did some some judo actually he did some judo, but they they actually made their name even before the UFC by training Hollywood people. You know, mm-hmm. I, I one of them trained uh. Do you remember the Lethal Weapon series starring mm-hmm. Mel Gibson? Mm-hmm. And in one of the Lethal Weapons, I think it could have been the first one, Lethal Weapon One. He did a a little move on the ground called uh, Sankaku, which is a triangular lock with the legs on you know the bad guy. You know that was uh, he had learned that from the Gracies. They had been hired to be consultants for uh, uh, you know for for Lethal Weapon. Which brings me to a very very important question: Can you use judo to? protect yourself in street fight? Uh, that's an interesting question. I guess the most, uh, I, I would say, responsible and accurate way to answer that is that, yes, you can, but it's really not designed for that. Okay, And what I mean is this. Judo is not, un- unlike, let's say, Silat, and unlike Krav Maga. You've heard of Krav Maga, yes, right? Yes, of course. This, yeah. yeah. It's not designed to be a means of self-defense. And judo really, ha- since the 1960s, uh, 1964, has evolved very much as an Olympic sport. 
So it's a sport. It's very much a sport, a so, game where you you trying to win. You're trying to score points and, and win. So is that why you also say we play judo and you all call yourself players? Yes, exactly, exactly. We play judo and we are judo players. So because okay. we we see ourselves as athletes and not so much. I mean, some slightly more traditional judo guys would say, "Oh, judo fighters." But actually, if you talk to you know top world champions and things like that, they use the phrase judo player. So we don't pretend to say that, hey, you know, ours is the best martial art to defend yourself. But having said that, I mean, if you're good at judo, logically you should be fairly well equipped to mm-hmm. defend yourself. Mm-hmm. But when we train, uh, the objective is to score a point to win that gold medal. Mm-hmm. The objective is not to take that guy out in a bar fight. Very interesting. Very interesting. So you have a judo class that you in in Malaysia, right? In KL that you run regularly, and you know, bar bar the the COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I have a, a judo club. It's called uh, KL Judo Center. In uh, it's in in Pudu. Uh, right now we are semi open in the sense semi open in the sense that the club is open, but we're severely restricted in what we are allowed to do. And what mm-hmm. we can do. Mm-hmm. There's a limit on the number of players we can have on the mat. Uh, social distancing. Mm. You know, we can't do contact. And I remember speaking offline with you, and you were saying like, "How on earth do you train judo?" Exactly. Uh, you yeah. know, when when you have to socially distance, because mm. judo is the most full contact of sports. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, it's more full contact than even rugby. You know, people mm-hmm. think of rugby as super full contact, right? But rugby, there are times when you're not tackling somebody. There are times yeah. when you're running on the field, right? Yes, yes. In judo, you're constantly in contact. The only other sport that I can think of that is as full contact as judo is wrestling. Mm-hmm. Nothing else, you know. I mean, not even rugby, not even American football, uh, because you're always in contact. And now suddenly we have to practice without any contact. In fact, we have to be two meters, two three meters apart. So how do you do that? With a lot of difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> But, but to be serious, uh, what we do is uh, we do what is called well the equivalent of shadow boxing. Mm-hmm. You know, when okay. people shadow boxing, mm-hmm. so we're doing shadow judo. So we imagine a partner, and I would describe to my players, right? This is the move that you need to do, and they have to do it with an imaginary partner. Mm-hmm. That's for standing. So I would go through the motions. They would mimic what I'm doing, and they would have to visualize and imagine that they've actually got a partner when, in fact. They don't have a partner. That's that's for the standing, the throwing. For groundwork, it is really difficult to imagine doing ground techniques on an invisible partner. So what I've done is I've got them to uh, to to get these big teddy bears. You know, you can buy these <laughs> big, big teddy bears online from Lazada and Shopee. You know, literally like you know 160 cm, 180 wow. cm, <laughs> big teddy bears, and they will stand in for a grappling dummy. You know, because grappling dummies are difficult to find and expensive. Mm-hmm. They buy teddy bears and they do their techniques on teddy bears because they can't do on each other. A little bit frustrating, you know, not being able to do real judo mm-hmm. and certainly not being able to spar. You know, what I tell my judo players and I guess what they do to console themselves is that, uh, well, this is better than nothing. Better than mm. staying at home and doing nothing. How many students do you have? We have 30 adults and about 10 children. But the children, uh, they they do all their judo training by Zoom. They're mm-hmm. not physically mm-hmm. there during this time. But the adults, at the moment, we're limited to about six, mm-hmm. six people per session, you know, so that we can socially distance and all that. So at any one time, we'll have six. So you're really passionate about judo, huh? Crazy. It's part of my life. It's not just something I do, but it's, it's part of my life. And I think it defines me as a person as much as, you know, a, being a, a writer. So if you could nail it down to two things, if you let your you know, you've learned from judo that you apply on yourself, you know, what would they be? In contrast to you, where you were attracted to Silat because of its philosophical leanings at an, a very early age, right? You were a teenager when you discovered Silat and you were immediately attracted to that mm-hmm. philosophical aspect of it and the stories and all that. That wasn't the case for me, you know? I mean, I, I was only attracted to the sporting aspect of it initially. And it was really much, much later in life and only really when I was, became a coach mm-hmm. and also in later years as a coach, not immediately, that I sort of appreciated the more philosophical aspects of judo and uh, the other aspects of judo. Uh, for me, for a long time, it was just a sport. But then judo became more than a sport for me. But initially, it was purely a sport. 
but now to answer your questions, uh, I guess uh, the first thing is that, well, this will sound corny because a lot of people say it, but you know, when you fall down, you get up. Right? Mm-hmm. And in judo, you fall down a lot. Right? A lot, yeah. So in judo, you spend all, I mean, the first nine months, all I did was spending my time getting up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't throw anybody. So that's one thing that I think has really uh, helped me in life, which is, you know, in other aspects of life, when I fall down, when I fail, I just think back of judo and I think how many times did I have to pull myself off the ground, right? Uh, in fact, since my very first introduction to judo, my very first judo lesson, I was thrown about, right? So, so you can throw me in any environment, you know, in any endeavor and I won't get faced so easily by failure or defeat. So that, I think that's one thing that has really helped me. That's, re- that's really Mr. Miyagi, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw Karate Kid before I picked up Judo. So it's a, it's a wonder I never took up Karate. <laughs> right, but have you watched the, the sequel, uh, Cobra Kai? Cobra Kai, no. I saw, I've seen clips. It's corny la, to me. I, 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 Did no, you watch la, it? Yeah, suddenly I'm looking and said, wow, all these Karate moves look terrible. <laughs> so I, I hate to say it. Like, no, it looks, it, they look terrible. So. But you did learn karate, yeah? And yeah, yeah, a bit of karate. Budokan, sebukan. And... So, Jake, uh, before I answer the second thing, you asked me two things, right, that I learned. Okay. Let me okay. just ask you, what's, what's the two th- most important thing that you think you learned uh, from Silat? Well, in Silat, they say that, you know, Silat is, is, is broken into two, bua, uh, it's a bunga and bua. So, bunga and? Bua. Bua, fruit. Bua, bua, fruit, yeah. So, there's flower and there's fruit. So, bunga means it's the beauty you see in Silat. Like when you go, you see the beauty when they move, the grace and all that. You know, so people think that that is just fluff, but it's not because that is actually the setup for the pua. The pua is the attack. So, okay. in Silat, they say there is, you know, there is no, there is no attack without the beauty. So, you have to learn the beauty first. So, a lot of people come there and say, oh, what is this? You know, I've seen this. What are you guys going to hit? But when they realize that how deadly it can be, then you understand. So, to me, that's life also. You have to go through that to actually, you know, the second thing is, I like this because it takes a lot from a, a Malay proverb, which says, Ibaratkan padi, lebih berisi, lebih tunduk. That means the more you know, the more you must become humble. You know? Ah, okay. So humility must be there. So you ask me why I don't go and talk about it all, no, because it's nothing to talk about. It's I'm doing it for me. I really right, enjoy it. Right. And I, like I said, it's, it's, you know, I'm always a student. I'm always a student. I'm always learning. In these days, it's so easy. You go to YouTube and you're picking up various different people like you're doing silat and all that. You know, so it's really interesting. So yeah, but I'm intrigued by martial arts. So I guess it it, it gave me a lot of discipline like, because I can't I came from a very angry, you know, angry teenage life. And yeah, so it gave me a lot of discipline. It gave me an anchor. Like. Right, right. For me, uh I, I would say the second thing, which is I, I guess not any less important than the first thing. The first one being that when you fall down you get up, right? The uh, the second thing would be uh, I would say that, uh, you, know, you know how I mentioned to you that um, initially for me, it was just sport. And then subsequent to that, you know, in later years, it became more than sport, right? You know, judo from the start, Dr. Jigoro Kano, the founder, wanted to infuse a very strong moral element to judo. To him, judo is not just a sport. But, uh, you know, you, you actually literally have to be a good person. Mm-hmm. And if you're not a good person and you're a bully or, you know, you, you act in a bad way, then you're not really a judoka. Mm-hmm. And of course, there are people who practice judo who are bad. You know? mm-hmm. So those people are not really judokas. And uh, that kind of thing really resonates with me today. I feel that judo has made me a better person and I strive to be a better person because you know, I, I'm a coach today and you know, I'm no longer a competitor and I, I coach uh, students, right? And, and to me, it's important that I lead by example and I try to be a good person in the way I conduct myself and so on because I'm teaching students Mm -hmm. and i want them to have those good qualities and if i behave badly you know then you'll be like you know uh do as i tell you not do as i do you know you know so so i I don't want that so i have i'm you know i'm forced to be a better person in that sense so it's made me a better person uh, yeah so uh, so are you are you uh sort of uh Vying the national coach position? Or are you already the national coach? Well, no, I'm a state coach. I, I'm the coach for Sukma. You know, Sukma is the Sukma, under 21 yeah, so. yeah, for federal territories. Mm-hmm. And um, Malaysia doesn't actually have a national team per se, unlike uh, many countries because judo is so, so niche. So how do you take part in the SEA Games and all that? Well, what we do is that we have the national championships. And from 
that competition they choose somebody goes we'll take him him, him no no him, no, no, no they, they'll choose the winners they usually choose oh, from the winners so okay. that's fair enough but mm-hmm. but you know in other countries where judo is more popular and they have several competitions throughout the year as well as competitions overseas you accumulate points from each competition and then at the end of the year or whenever it comes time for selection you look at who has the highest points well, among the criteria. Less, yeah. yeah. For us here, the ranking is based entirely on one competition simply because there's only one competition a year. Or there are other competitions, but they don't, they're small and they're, they're not counted. So, so it's based on that one competition. So if you win that one competition, then you, get, you have a chance to go to the So team. when this Judo Cup represent Malaysia and go to you know, the Sea Games and all that, who is the coach that goes with them then? So then a coach will be selected. Usually you'll be, usually it's, it's somebody who comes from one of the sports schools. You know, we have, we have a sports school in Terengganu, yeah, yeah. we have a sports mm-hmm. school in Johor. Mm-hmm. And uh, it would be natural that they would be selected because most of our players will mm-hmm. come from the sports school. Oh, okay. So, yeah, but we don't, we don't have a full-time national team. We don't have a full-time national coach. We don't have anything like that. So how many gold medals have we won in Sea Games and Asian you know, Games? I tell you what, we've not won a Sea Games gold medal easily in 40 years, maybe. My God. Yeah, something like that. You know, yeah, I think it's easily 40 years since we've we've won a, a gold medal, but around 40 years. So uh, we're still looking for that elusive gold medal. We've we've got bronzes, we've got silver. Maybe we should even. pull you pull you out of retirement. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I, I need to go for some knee surgery first. <laughs> surgery, yeah. But you mentioned you also have bad knees. Huh? Very bad, yeah. So yeah, Both, both is, your knees? Both my knees, yeah. I've torn both my ACL, the meniscus is gone. So I, I didn't go for surgery like, for some strange reason. I thought it would heal by itself. But um, in retrospect, I'm glad I didn't go because uh, over the last 10 years, I've been training, you know, uh, to compensate on that and, and you know, after a proper warm up, you know, I, I can do a full squat and stuff like that. So I, I can't do those sudden movements. I was a goalkeeper, I played hockey, I played, I was quite athletic and stuff. But I can't do those sudden movements. So, you know, so again, like I said, I, I'm thankful I can walk with it. So. Right, right. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've had knee surgery twice mm-hmm. on one leg, my left leg. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've not had knee surgery on my right leg, although I actually need it. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's my ACL is pretty much torn on that one as mm-hmm. well. So, yeah, you know, it's it's a killer on the knees. Uh. I, think, I think martial arts in general is a killer on the knees. Sport, yeah, I went, sports yeah, I in went general. Up, but... Yeah, I went up Kinabalu and uh, I, had to, I had to, you know, wrap my knee in. But I managed to do it. But when I came down, came back, because it's really pretty taxing. And when you're coming down, and by the time you reach down, the synovial fluid is all over and then it's swollen and stuff. Like, so, yeah. So, yeah. Actually, you know, in, in terms of Silat, uh, whether practicing or coaching, how often do you do it? Is it like a, a few times a week or is it yeah, once twice, a week? Usually twice a week, you know. Twice a week, yeah. But something you do every day is work out. You work out every day, right? Every day. Every day without fail. I also am a personal trainer, so... I also train a few people. So yeah, it's something I enjoy. Like. I think it just, it just keeps me happy, you know. Yeah, so tell me, I mean, your personal workout, your own, uh, what do you do and how, how long do you do it for? Anything more than 45 minutes to an hour is a waste of time. Like, if you're doing uh, 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 weight training, anything more than that is a waste of time. That means you're really not intense in the gym, you know. Okay. Uh, but apart from that, I also do a bit of cardio. So, which I don't... You know, I usually do the cardio when I get up, you know, and fasted every time. I, it's not, you don't need to do it like that, but, you know, it helps. Uh, so my workouts are every day, five days a week. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, I usually go for a hike or for a walk or something. Which is like a that. workout as well. Yeah, yeah but it, yeah, at, at, a, at a leisurely pace. Uh, yeah. Right. So your weekdays workout, you, you do a cardio in the morning. Is that right? Uh, is, that, is that a... A jog or what is it? No, no. You sometimes can be a jog. Sometimes I like, do a bike ride. Sometimes can be a hike. Yeah. So walk around the neighborhood. You ride a bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just around the neighborhood or around the neighborhood, and yeah, I'm not that adventurous. Like some people go here 50 kilometers. No lah. Like, it's it's just around here, you know. So how long would you how long would you cycle? An hour for me. And cardio is 60 minutes here. Yeah. Okay, so if if you are jogging, you also jog an hour. Yeah. Right. Right. And your knees are okay when you jog? Uh, I'm jogging at a very, very slow pace. <laughs> yeah, like. that's so, what I do too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very slow pace. Like, you know. So if not, you, you, you will see the, the fluid come out and, you know, so. Yeah. It's fine, yeah. But it has improved tremendously after I put a lot of em- emphasis on working out my legs. Right, right. So I do a lot of leg work, yeah. 
and then in the evening you do your own personal exercise or is it in the afternoon uh usually in the afternoon you right. know and I, that's I, that's for 45 minutes yeah about 45 minutes an hour done yeah then i sometimes i have some 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 people i train throughout the day so yeah yeah so you mentioned uh personal training that that mm-hmm. you you conduct how did that come about always been dabbling in fitness like i guess so then i got my you know personal training certification a few years ago so I've always, it's actually, I've learned more through trial and error. I used to be training in the national gym in 97 when they were, when they first opened up, you know, in the jungle gym in, in Bukit Jalil. So, you know, I trained with uh, national bodybuilders, national, you know, but the sport has evolved so much that, you know, and you keep learning. It's just, it's just crazy like, from, from back in the day till now. So, so to me, it's like, the, just a natural thing to do. Like. You got so much, you got so much knowledge imparted to somebody like, when did you start giving personal training? Uh, about two, three years ago. Yeah, All two, right. Years ago, yeah, After yeah. you retired, is it from from your no, corporate no, job? No, 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 no. While while I was doing it, and it was just a good transition. Oh, so okay. Because, yeah, it's it's really weird because when I look back at my Facebook memories, which turn up every day, everything is about fitness. For so the last <laughs> ten years, everything is about fitness. So I said, this is actually what I wanted to do. So it was a natural progression, like. So you know what, fitness to you is like judo to me. You know, it's something yes. that you, you yes. that you live every day. You talk about it, post yes. about it, right? Yes. So, yes. so yes. it would be the equivalent in that sense. I mean, it seems like a stupid question, but what is it about fitness that has gotten you so obsessed about it? You know, I mean, obviously it's good for your health and you want to live a longer, healthier life, but everybody wants to live a healthier life. What is it about fitness and weight training and strength training that really turns you on? Yeah, I, I, I think the word is turn you on. You see, the thing about a lot of people don't understand that excessive cardio over long periods of time, your body becomes more efficient. You've seen all this, sometimes it's cyclists were cycling and cycling and cycling, but they still have a belly and they still, you know what I mean? Because your body becomes very, very efficient, you know? And you and right. the elixir and the elixir of life is for males, uh, testosterone, right? You know, so again, like I said, it's use it or lose it. So <laughs> when, you're, when, you're do, when you're doing compound weight work, you know, and, and I tell a lot of people this, they're telling me, oh, you know, I don't want to go to the gym. I said, but dude, you need to lift weights because eventually your muscles protect your bones and your muscles, you know, yeah. your, your, you know, your body you sends a signal to your brain saying, you know what? Hey, this guy needs testosterone. It elevates his testosterone level and hormones are everything. So there are people, I, I have friends who are, you know, who I contact through Instagram and stuff like doing in the 70s looking great. You know what I mean? Looking absolutely great. Not, not, and I've seen this couple walk here near my area. There's, there's 80s. They're walking. They're walking every day. But I see that uncle is hunched a little bit. The wife is hunched because, again, like I said, they're doing cardio. The heart's great. But the rest of the but, body but is muscle. Moving, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got to do both. You know. How did you get your very first uh, uh, client? I guess yeah, you could call them. Yeah, all friends, like you know, all, all, all friends, all friends, and they, you know, they, they see, hey, Jack, what are you doing? What are you doing? Can you, can you give me? And then you're telling yourself, hey. Why don't I just charge you, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so with, yeah, with my experience and you know, I you know I've had some very good success with people because I you know it's it's not my bread and butter, but I, if you don't charge them, what happens is they don't take it serious. You know true, what I'm saying? True, true, true. I think it's I yeah I enjoy it. Mm. Obviously, you enjoy the, the 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 physical workout yourself, but you also enjoy teaching. You also enjoy Definitely. imparting Definitely. that knowledge, right? What is it? about uh, teaching makes you enjoy it so much? To me, it's, it's, I like to see the change in people, you know? So I've seen people, I, I trained a guy, John, who was 172 kilos, and now he's 89 in 90 kilos. He lost half his weight, you know? So you can see the change in his mindset, change in how he was, change in his confidence, you know? Change in everything. A lot of people don't understand that, you know, it can be done, but you need somebody there pushing you, you know? so. So you like being that person that, that yes, helps yes, to bring yes. about that change. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, you know, it's enlightening like me. So it's, it's, you learned a lot while teaching also. You know, for me, when I first started coaching, all I was interested in was coaching competitors. That's all I was interested I wasn't interested in coaching recreational judo players. You know, uh, to me, judo was about competing, you know, back then. So, so I was a very lopsided coach in that sense. I only looked at competition. And, uh, but, Subsequent to that, in later years, I mellowed a bit. And, and you know, I discovered uh, an interest in, in teaching recreational players as well. And to me, the, the interest in, in coaching or what I find fulfilling is that actually, uh, this may sound, re- and it will sound corny, but really, 
judo and the judo club that that I run right provides not just fitness and you know training for these people but you know it's a sense of joy for them to be able to come to the club and meet friendly faces i i, I actually understand i actually understand because you know it's it's a it's a community yeah exactly yeah. Exactly. The community, yeah, you know, it's it's no different from you know the sila I teach or going to the gym and meeting all the people and yes, chatting exactly. with people. And so yeah, you gravitate to people with the same interests. So I can totally understand. It. Yeah, and and to be able to provide that, I know you don't talk much about the fact that you teach sila, but don't you don't you feel get a a, a real sense of satisfaction that actually you're providing a service, you're providing a really valuable service, especially in these dreaded times. You know, when people have to socially distance and they can't meet other people and they're stuck at home, that, you know, by, by having this uh, thing, whether it's through Zoom or physically, despite, you know, the social distancing, they, they actually get to interact with other people. It, it's true because in these times, actually, you can see like who is actually uh, invested in you. You know what I mean? So like you're doing the Zoom classes and stuff, that's brilliant. You know, same thing. You know, I tell my students, anytime call me, I'll have a chat with you. You know, I mean... Um, you know, people have been through some, you know, depressing time. In fact, we, I have a chat group and I said, all just my boys and my students, and I said, hey, uh, if you guys need anything, and even if it's, a, if it's something that can help you out, uh, direct message me, I'll try to help you out if I can. So again, like I said, it's community. People need to know that there's somebody behind you that cares. It, I, well, I, the phrase I use for my students is an extended judo family definitely, that, definitely. that you can fall back on. Yeah, so, so, so to be able to facilitate that, you know, to create that, that community for other people, I think is, 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 for me, it's very fulfilling. You know, I, I, I realize that that's an important role beyond just training them to be fighters or to be competitors. It's providing that service, so to speak. And it's a very important service at all times, but particularly so during this pandemic. Yeah, you're preaching the converted. I totally agree with you <laughs> on this. And, and, you know, it's, again, like I said, a lot of people, that's the little that they, they you know, sense of acknowledgement, sense of belonging and all that. When you take that away from them, especially in these times, you know, it can even, you know, uh, drop them into a darker place. So, yeah. Yeah. So, Jake, before we end this, tell me if somebody who doesn't know you personally wants to, uh, to, to be trained by you personally, how do they go about doing that if they don't know you personally? Can they reach out to you or is it only for your friends? No, no, no. I mean, you can, you can, there are two of us, my partner and I, Mas, we, we have, you know, we do this. Mas is 20 years younger than me, an Iranian guy, competitive bodybuilder, trainer, brilliant physique. So both of us do it. So you can reach out to me on Instagram. My handle is Jake Abdullah. You know, if I can accommodate you, I don't take many people because I don't, I don't want to, to me, it's not, again, like I said, it's not a source of, you know, my livelihood, but, I want to make sure I can deliver to you. Every day, these guys call up and send me what they eat. They tell me how much they weigh. <laughs> yeah. you know? So they're going on holiday. They tell me what they eat. So to me, it's like it's a vested interest. I want to make sure that you get where you are. And I, you know, so I teach them diet. I teach them everything. So again, like I said, if I take 100 people and do it online like that, uh, you know what I mean? It's going to be a template. And I don't think that it'll be, uh, be fair. So, well, that you mentioned diet, and and uh, I think that we're gonna save that for another podcast where we talk. For sure. I think it deserves to be its own podcast. But uh, but but lastly, I mean, do you, do you want to mention at all about pricing and how? Do, do you all, or, no, like you oh. know, you, 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 you <laughs> so they got the, they've got to contact you for the yeah, pricing. <laughs> you have to contact me. For, for, <laughs> I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I'm actually very very comparable to everybody. You know, so really, very, very, really, very, really, really. Okay. Uh, I also have standard prices. Okay, so so it's not just multi-millionaires and CEO tycoons who can who, who can afford you. <laughs> no, la, no, la, but somehow it seems to attract the crowd. La, that that seems to be yeah. your clientele. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you need to rack up the prices. And, okay. and, and they should pay a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, I think so. I have one last question for you. How much does your judo class cost? It's 360 ringgit a month. Well, how many classes? Like right now, we have 10 sessions a week. Two sessions on Tuesday, two sessions on Wednesday, two sessions on Thursday, two sessions on Friday, and two sessions on uh, Sunday. So you, you conduct all? Actually, there's 11 sessions. There's a children's session also, conducted by a, a junior instructor. But the adults one, I conduct all, yeah. So if I want to learn, I got to come in as a white belt, lah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Unless, unless you, you're, you've previously have some... some no, la, no, no. Yeah. But, uh, you know, let's say somebody comes from another club. If somebody comes to our club and they have, a, let's say, a green belt, 
uh, and even if we feel that their knowledge level or skill level is not that of a green belt at our club, we'll recognize that green belt because they came from another club and we'll recognize that green belt. But for them to advance to the next belt color, which is blue, they need to learn the green belt syllabus of our club and be capable at the level that we set before they can go to blue. So they don't have to start from white and then climb up again. They, they, they are at green, but they, they need to learn everything that our green belts, our homegrown green belts uh, learn. Uh, but, you know, belt color doesn't really... It, it, you know, belt color is an important um, uh, gauge of progress, but, and, and, and I, it's important to beginners because they can, they can gauge their progress that way. But, you know, in terms of skills and abilities, I mean, somebody who's very fit and very athletic and naturally talented, right, could come in and train and, and after a few months, you know, even before they get their first belt, they might be able to beat somebody in sparring, yeah. right, in yeah. randori, who's a yellow belt or orange belt or even a green belt, you know. So, belt color doesn't necessarily... Yeah, it's just a goalpost for people to, you know... It, yeah, it, it's yeah. not a very clear indicator of, of capabilities per se, but it is an indicator of how much you've progressed in terms of or what you've learned. But in terms of practical applications, that is very much a function of your physicality. If you see a green belt from our club, you know that that guy or that girl knows this set amount of techniques. They understand mm. those techniques, right? It doesn't tell you anything about their ability to compete mm -hmm. or to fight or to, to spar. It just tells you that they have a certain knowledge level. It, yeah, you know, judo is a very physical sport. So how well you, you do as a judo player, how good you are at throwing somebody or submitting them and all that is a function of your physicality, which is um, sometimes different from just your knowledge. Ideally, it's both. Right? You're, you're good physically and you also have a good understanding. But sometimes some people have a good understanding of the technique, but they're not that physically capable. Mm -hmm. And some people are very physically capable, but they don't have very in-depth knowledge, you know. So, yeah, ideally, it's both. At your level, you definitely have acquired both. Well, from the start, actually, for me, um, when I was competing, I, I always felt it was important to have both. That, that physical aspect as well as the knowledge. A lot of competitors uh, focus on the physical aspect. And, uh, and a lot of my contemporaries, when I was training overseas, right, they, they really only focus on the competition and only focus on the, on the physical aspect of judo. And while judo was only a sport for me uh, at that time, I still bothered to learn the theory and, and, and learn uh, a lot of the, the knowledge behind judo. Not because I thought it was anything philosophical or whatever, but, but I, I felt it was important to, uh, for me personally to know all these things. For example, uh, uh, you know, in judo, uh, as a sport, if you can do two or three moves very well, that's enough to win. If you can, mm. you, you don't need to have, you know, 60 moves. You, you just need three moves, right? If you can do it really well, it's enough to win, right? And so a lot of competitors tended to do that. I only need to know three stuff. So, you know, that's all I focus on. I never did that, even though I had my three moves that I focused on. But, you know, in judo, there's technically... Uh, under the canon of judo, they call it the gokyo. There's like a hundred moves, right? I bothered to learn them. Not because I, I thought that I could possibly use all of those. You can't possibly use all of that. You, you can only use a small fraction of that. And so I had my two or three moves that I liked. But I did bother to learn the other 97 moves just because I felt it completed my knowledge. So I always did that even from, from the start. But, uh, but a lot of competitors don't. They just said, that, well, why do you need to learn all that stuff if... You only need these three moves and they focus on that. So, Wow, I got renewed respect, man, for you. I would be very worried. You might just arm lock me somewhere and throw it on the floor. <laughs> do, you, do you guys have arm locks in, uh, in, in, in yes, Silat? Yes, you do, you yes, do have, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think most martial arts have. Yeah, so it'd be interesting actually to compare techniques because I saw some of the clips that you sent me of, of uh, uh, you teaching Silat and some of the moves are, are resemble judo moves. Some of the, the takedowns mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you do so. I'm sure. I'm sure there are similarities between most of these martial arts. Yeah. And, and like to me, is mine is like you know, what do you do if you're in this situation? You're like Krav Maga or so. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like Krav Maga. Mm. Krav Maga is not a sport. You know, you don't yeah, do Krav, you don't do Krav Maga as a sport. And I suspect 
with with silat is the same thing, right? Silat is yeah, not... but there's silat olaraga, which is in the sea games, which is is similar to you know. To, so to they've the... adapted it to become a sport. Yes, yes. But traditionally, it's not a sport. No, it's not. Right, right. You, you actually you likened it to capoeira, right? You said that, yeah, uh, capoeira uh, which... because it's got a dance element, is it? Yeah, that's that's interesting. That's interesting. So are, are you much of a dancer? You're a good dancer, are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you used to go clubbing. You used to go two, clubbing. Two, two <laughs> yeah, I, I watched that. Two, two left feet, like. Uh. <laughs> okay, so, Jake. So you know uh, that this is an interesting departure from what we usually do. Uh, next up, we we've got Hannah Yo. So that's right. That's that's mm -hmm. going to be interesting. So I look forward to that. Thanks for listening to OJ Chit Chats. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. Support us by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Alternatively, you can listen to us on www.ojchitchats.com or follow OJ Chitchats on Instagram and Facebook and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's juicy.